Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly edition of Daily News Simplified where we take up the important articles from the Indian Express explained section throughout the week and the Sunday edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles taken up for today's discussion are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. But before starting the discussion there is an important announcement with respect to the upcoming pre-parikshan examination for you. Now as you all know that the second pre-parikshan test has been announced and it has been scheduled on 18th and 19th March 2023 both in an online and offline manner. Now if you have not registered yourself go to rauis.com and register yourself and do appear for this very important pre-parikshan test which is to be conducted on 18th and 19th March both in an online manner and also in an offline manner. So what are you waiting for? register yourself and check your preparation level which is so important before the very important prelims examination this article of the indian express explained section talks about the agriculture and the level of employment being provided by the agriculture sector in india now agriculture since the independence has been the largest employer in the country as far as economic activity is concerned and still over 45% of the total employment comes from the agricultural sector and its allied services now in this article the author has highlighted that despite the economic growth agriculture sector has been one of the largest provider of the employment and the value addition in the economy on this article he has highlighted that agriculture sector despite producing just 17 to 18% of the gdp produces very high value addition to a product now before going deeper into the topic and understanding the entire concept you should understand what is value addition we are going to understand that through an example assume that there is a product which requires an input and this input cost around 100 rupee now this input was bought by the manufacturer manufacturer has transformed this input which costed 100 rupee into an output which has now costed 150 rupee let's say the input was a piece of cloth and the output is a piece of shirt now the value addition of 50 rupees is something that has been done in agriculture the value addition is the one which is provided by the agricultural laborers while producing a particular crop In agriculture the inputs included seed irrigation water electricity or power and the labor cost when labor produces a product a crop he requires the inputs in agricultural the cost of input is quite low in comparison to the service sector or the manufacturing in manufacturing sector we require very heavy capital investment to open a factory to buy machinery a person may require even crores of rupees to start a business and that business may not give the positive returns in the first 2 3 years so in the manufacturing sector and even in the service sector the returns on the investment takes time plus the input cost is high on the other hand in the agriculture sector the input cost is low because here subsidy is being provided by the government the price of seed is far low than the price of machinery in the manufacturing sector so the input cost in agriculture is low output on the other hand is increasing at a annual growth of 2 to 4% hence according to the writer the value addition in the agriculture sector is far more than of the other service sector or the manufacturing sector he has highlighted this through various examples and data set that you might utilize in the mains and the writing for your gs paper 3 for example according to the author the agriculture sector in comparison to the manufacturing sector has shown the declining trend in the employment generation as you can see in 1993 that is just 2 years after the liberalization the total employment provided by the agriculture sector was around 64.6% So out of 100 workers in India 64 were employed in the agriculture sector while 10 were in the manufacturing Once you observe this you will find that there has been a decline from 64 to 45 that is almost a decline of 19 to 20% in the agriculture sector however it has not been visible in the manufacturing sector then where that 20% of the excess labor went they are now employed in the service sector let me give you a simple example a farmer who has lost his crop 
who has high dues is now working as a rickshaw puller in the urban city so he has transformed himself from an agricultural labor in rural economy to a service sector provider this is a structural flaw in indian economy that a person and an economy and a labor force should shift from the agriculture or the primary sector to that of the manufacturing or the secondary sector but here they have moved directly from the primary sector that is agriculture to the tertiary sector that is service sector which is not a good sign in the long term economic growth the second table given in the article was the value added so as you can see on the screen in 2021 and 22 according to the national statistical office the highest value addition comes from the agriculture sector now we have already discussed what value addition is so as the input cost in the agriculture sector is quite low overall agricultural output has remained very very high so the returns on the agriculture sector is good on the other hand the employment is going down it shows that agriculture sector as of now is showing promising results if it wants to increase to a much higher level more capital investment would be required on the lines of what we are seeing in the service and the manufacturing sector after agriculture it is the other areas which includes the public administration personal services and financial services on the other hand the manufacturing value addition is only 21% which is very very low or just 1/4 of what agriculture is doing right now now let's talk about the observations which were highlighted by the writer in the article the first is that agriculture employment as you have saw that it has come down to 45% from the 64% now it is based this 45% is based on the national statistical offices data on periodic labor force survey which started since 2017 the data of 64% in 1993 was based on the employment and unemployment data collected by the same the biggest decline was in the years between 2004 and 2011 that is the boom year when the indian economy and even the global economy was going through the boom there was a rise of employment in the manufacturing sector as well so this was a phase when we saw that the labor was actually shifting from agriculture sector to that of the manufacturing sector now there are multiple reasons for this the first one is that the rural population is now declining if you go by the national family health survey you go by the total fertility rate you'll find that in most of the state india has already got the replacement rate and this is true with respect to the rural population so as the population is falling down so is going to be the working population the second is the rising labor productivity whenever there is a rise in the labor productivity fixed number of laborers are going to produce more output once they produce more output there is going to be the unnecessary disguised unemployment the people who are part of the disguised unemployment are going to be the one who is going to migrate the most so there will be the fall in the disguised employment itself there is another reason which is the rural to urban migration as urban areas are throwing more opportunities because of the manufacturing and the service sector a person can earn quick money as far as these sectors are concerned a person can lead a better livelihood can get a sustainable income in the long term if he or she is finding it difficult to earn the same level of income in the rural areas apart from that urban areas in a developing country act as a magnets through the avenues that they throw for the employment generation then there is a rising family income in the rural india in the last 10 years it has been observed through the data compiled by the nsso and the central statistical organization that the overall income in the rural area is now increasing the moment a household income increases female who are who were employed previously give up their jobs and look after the family especially the child caring as the family income is rising so is the declining in the overall employment in the rural india then comes the expansion in the rural service sector be it the mobile telephony be it the cooking gas be it the dth television services or any other service service sector is now gaining more currency in the rural india as it was in the two or three decades back 
So rising of the service sector has also provided avenues for the labor to shift from the primary sector to the tertiary sector. And the last one is there are government schemes such as MG Narega, which are pulling out the labor from the primary sector activities, especially the agriculture, to the other skilled and non-skilled based services. India as of now is lacking behind in the structural transformation. Now please understand this. This is a key term and could be asked in the prelims as well as the mains examination. Structural transformation, according to many economists, refers to a compositional shift that entails transfer of surplus labor. So there's a sector which has a surplus labor and that sector is agriculture. So the labor which is transferring from agriculture to other sectors where the productivity that is output per labor and the average income are higher. Now it is a global phenomenon that manufacturing and the service sector pay more money. So labor productivity and average income in manufacturing and service sector is higher. So the surplus labor which was there in the agriculture is now shifting to these two sector. And this is what is known as structural transformation. So there is a transformation of labor from one sector of the economy to the other sector where it is getting more income. But according to the writer, India is lacking behind in this area. Why? Because as we have seen in this table, the share of employment of the manufacturing has not increased even in the last three decades. So this is a matter of concern. Hence, we can conclude that structural transformation is yet not materialized in India completely. Most of the jobs created outside the agriculture sector are in the construction sector, which is a good sign, but they are mostly low paid jobs and they are not organized. They are not informal. So a person who was earlier employed as an agricultural labor, who was a farmer previously, may shift to the urban areas, but now he's working as a construction labor. He's working on the daily wages. He may or he may not get the regular employment over there. He might be a marginal employer in the urban areas. Agriculture sector has a high value addition as we have discussed per output because there is a low input cost and there are early returns. So it hardly takes six months for a crop to grow and sell in the market. It never takes three, four or five years for a crop to grow until unless we are talking about the horticulture sector. So based on these observations, the writer has concluded that there is a structural transformation going on in India, but not at a promising level. Now, beyond this article, there are two, three observations that we have taken from a detailed report of Niti Ayo on the workflows, changes and the employment. Now, there are four observations that we have made and that will help you to substantiate your point in the means examination if a question on the employment is being asked. The first is with respect to the annual rate of change in the gross value added in agriculture. So how agriculture has been adding the value to the Indian GDP. So in 2017-18, it was around 6.39% lower than the other sector. Again, it was lower in 2018-19, but surprisingly in 2019 and after that, it has been higher than the non-agriculture sector. And especially in 2020-2021, because of the COVID crisis, agriculture was the one which was producing positive returns while service sector and the manufacturing were giving us the negative returns. The second observation from this Niti Aayog report is that the labor force in India classified into gender, rural and urban category. From here, you can easily understand that the female participation or female labor force has increased drastically from 82 million to 113 million, which is a very, very large increase. It's an increase of almost 30 million females. That is three crore females in just two year of span period. The next is that in urban areas also there was an increase from 30 to 36 but in comparison to the rural India, urban area or women in the urban area are quite low in terms of their working. Overall, yes, overall the labor force in India has increased drastically. The third observation is the labor force participation rate in rural India as far as female is concerned is around 24.68% which has increased from 18% and this has been in the last three years. 
This is a very, very good sign. On the other hand, even in the urban areas, it has increased, but not in comparison to what has happened in the rural India. The last observation is the percentage distribution of worker over the sectors. So in rural India, we are talking about, you can easily see that female are more involved than the male members. So when we talk about agriculture in rural India, female actually dominate the male. But when we talk about the service sector in the rural India, it is the male member who are dominating the female in terms of the urban area. Yes, here also you will find that in service sector, females are more marginally more than the male sector, especially in the health education sector. So you'll find female teachers, female nurses more than that of the male members. On the other hand, you'll find that the service sector in urban area attracts more share of population than that of the rural India. So after this entire discussion, we come to the following observation. And this is important. You can use this in your conclusions, your introduction, in your means examination as far as question from the employment is being asked. So the share of agricultural employment has declined sharply in the last three decades. There's a high value addition made by the agriculture even during the pandemic period. More rural female are employed than their urban counterparts. So employment ratio in female in rural area is more. There's a quantum jump in the female labor force participation rate in the last three year period. Female share of employment in agriculture is high in rural India. But when we talk about urban area, it is in the service sector. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Indian Express Explains section talks about the status of India's migrants. That is the internal migrants, a person who moves within the state and between the states, but inside the Indian borders. This article was published with respect to a context that there was a viral video in Tamil Nadu. And after that viral video, migrant workers working in Tamil Nadu had a fear of being attacked by the native people. And most of these are the Hindi speaking people. When this video became viral, there were apprehension that these migrant workers might leave Tamil Nadu and they might even face exodus. Based on this observation, the industrial houses, the businessmen and the commercial activities or the people associated with the industrial units feared that this might go in the wrong manner and might impact the overall industrial growth of the state. So this article actually talks about that uh, what is the current status of the migrants in India who are moving within the states and who are moving between the states. So according to the census 2011, so all this data is important first of all for you in your prelims as well in the mains examination. In the mains examination, this could be utilized in your GS paper one under Indian society. So according to 2011 census, the internal migrants were 45 crores, which is 37% of total population of India. In this migrants, 10 crores were the migrant workers. See, everyone who is moving from one city to the other, one urban area to the other, or one rural area to the other, does not mean that they are going for workforce. They might have any other reasons as well. They might be sick, they are going for the treatment, they might be going for the job, they might be going or transferring because of the marriage or marital alliances, they might be going for the study. So as far as migration is concerned, for worker, they contributed 10 crores, which is 20% of the labor force if we are thinking the labor force to be around 50 crore. The highest influx, that is in which area, the largest number of labor comes. It is the Delhi NCR, Mumbai, Indore, Bhopal, Bengaluru and Chennai. The highest outflow comes from selective states. 39 districts from the Uttar Pradesh, 8 districts each from Uttarakhand and Bihar, 3 districts each from Jharkhand and Rajasthan and 2 districts from the Maharashtra where the outflow of the migrant takes place. As far as the report of the working group on migration from the Ministry of Home Affairs, about one fourth of the migration comes from the 17 districts 
from UP and Bihar. So UP and Bihar together contribute around one fourth of the total migration of the labor for the workforce. As far as the Migration in India report 2020-21 from the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, 0.7% of India's migrants, that is around 7 lakh people, are temporary visitors. Who are temporary visitors? The one who is shifting the place because of the pandemic, maybe a temporary job loss, maybe lack of opportunities, maybe closure of the units or some health issues. So there are around 7 lakh people according to this report. Now beyond this article, there are many observations that you should know, the basic trends on the 2011 census on migration. So as you can see from this observation that women actually accounted 80% of the marginal migrant workforce. Now who is a marginal worker? The one who has worked less than 6 months. So if a person has worked less than 186 days in a year, he or she is going to be the marginal worker. So 80% of the marginal workers are women who are employed less than half of the year. Now if you go through the data of the migrant population, yes, between 2001 to 2011, the migrant population has increased drastically. So there was a contribution of almost 140 million people, that is almost 40 crore people increased with respect to the migration. The rural migrants are more than the urban migrants, of course, because of the high base population. The rural area sees more in migration. You must not get confused and not think that only the workers are the one who actually migrate. The rural to rural migration is very, very high. Why? And the most important reason behind this is the marital alliances. As far as rural population migration is concerned, so most of the rural population is actually migrating to the rural India and most of the urban population is actually migrating more to the urban areas. So rural to urban or urban to rural has still the low case. As far as work wise population is concerned, so yes, the main worker still contribute the largest section while the marginal workers who are working less than six months are still the less. It means that the people who are working as a marginal workers do not prefer to go for migration easily. The next observation is that while men accounts for bulk of the main workers, female have higher share in terms of marginal workers. So females in India are working more in those areas or in those sectors where they have to employ less than six months. For example, MG Narega. In MG Narega, a person cannot work entire year because there is a time frame, there is a duration to the max they can use as their employment. So as far as main workers are concerned, you can see, yes, males are more than female workers, but in terms of the marginal, females are far more than the male counterparts. When we talk about the new migrants, as we can see that there was a 23% of the overall increase in the migration within a decade of 2001 to 2011. The most new rural migrants go to the urban areas within the state. So yes, a person might shift from Ghazipur to Lucknow, a person might shift from let's say Jaisalmer to Jaipur or Nagpur to Mumbai rather than going to the other state. The one reason is because of the similar laws. There are state level laws, there are voting counts, a person can avail to the food, to the government schemes of a particular state and top of all there are language issues. So a person going from Nagpur to let's say Mumbai will not face the language issue. He or she can easily speak Marathi. A person going from Coimbatore to let's say Chennai can easily speak Tamil language and the same is true with the any other specific state. So the migration from ruler to urban is mostly seen within the state. Urban migrants also even prefer to go for the urban areas within the state. As far as level of education and migration is concerned, so yes, it is the mid-level education that is up to secondary level. In both the cases, whether you talk about 2001 or you talk about 2011, it is the mid-level education, not the graduation or not the illiteracy. It is the mid-level education that is from 6th to 12th standard and these are the workers who migrate the most. And the same trend was seen even in 2011. 20% of the rural migrants in 2011 studied beyond schooling. That is, they are going for the graduation. 
On the other hand, it was 44% as far as urban migrants is concerned. So based on this, we can conclude that in urban areas, graduate migrants dominate the non-graduate migrants. And lastly, we come to India's migration map. This is just for the reference. So don't go deeper into the data analysis over here. From this map, you can easily see that there are two, three regions in India where you will find more number of migration. For example, the Delhi NCR region is the one where you can see there is inbound migration. Large number of people coming to these areas from various states. On the other hand, you will find that the region in Uttar Pradesh is the one which is going for out migration. The arrows are depicting the same. The same is true with respect to Bihar. On the other hand, there are other magnets such as Gujarat where the inbound migration is very high. Then there is also the regions such as Maharashtra and in the south we have Tamil Nadu. Based on the discussion, you will be in a position to understand what is the migration in India, how it is being transformed, what is the ratio of female male migration, what are the basic reasons and how migration and literacy is associated in India. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Indian Express was published yesterday and talks about the landslide atlas of India, which was published by the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO. We are going to look into the observation of this land atlas and we are also going to look into the basic classification of landslides in India and their basic distribution. So context says that India is among the top five landslide prone countries globally, which is a very, very bad sign as far as humanity and habitation is concerned. And India is a place where one death per 100 square kilometers is reported every year due to the landslide. The statement of climate of India report given by the Indian Meteorological Department says that heavy rain, floods and landslide claim around over 800 lives in the country in 2022. The definition of the landslide says that it is a sudden movement of rock, boulders, earth or even debris down the slope due to gravity. And this is what is being observed in the hilly areas. This is not something that you will observe in the plain areas. The causes of the landslide include the geological causes, which is the weak, sensitive and the weathered material, which becomes sensitive as the time passes or the geological time scale passes, presence of joint and the fridges, variation in the physical properties, that is the permeability. The morphological reasons include the tectonic and the vocal volcanic uplift, erosion due to wind and water, higher deposition of load on slope or its crest and even the removal of the vegetation that is the deforestation. The physical cause may include the intensive rainfall, earthquake, volcanic eruption, rapid snow melting which is actually because of the climate change currently. The anthropogenic reasons or the reasons because of the human activity included excavation of the slopes, its tow, Deposition of the load on the slope, drawdown of the reservoirs, deforestation, mining, irrigation, artificial vibration because of the construction activity, especially the dam construction. As far as types of landslides are concerned, so they can be classified based on the material and the time taken for the material to go down the slope. The first is the fall. It is an abrupt movement of the material. Okay, so it may be detached from the steep slopes or the cliff moving by a free fall, bouncing and rolling. Next is the creep which is slow movement and goes steady down slope. Then comes the debris flow. It's a rapid movement of loose soil, rocks, organic material which are combined. So it's a debris form. Then comes the mud flow. Here it is rapid but the content of water is more. And the last one is the flows. It's a general term which includes many types of mass movements such as creep, debris flow, mud flow and the others that we have discussed. As far as impact of the landslides are concerned, so it can be classified into two. The first is the short run, the second one is the long run. On the short run, it will lead to the damage of property, loss of lives, destruction of the agricultural crops which are situated down the slopes, damage to the vegetation, especially the forest area, obstruction created to the vehicular movement leading to a traffic jam or the temporary loss of livelihood for many people.
In terms of the long run, it will increase the sedimentation load in the rivers that is going to have flooding situation. It will also impact the dams situated down the slope. It will reduce the effective life of the hydroelectric and the multi-purpose projects because of the sedimentation. The loss of cultivable land and the infrastructure, especially roads. Environmental impact in terms of the erosion and the soil loss and the demographic impact in terms of the relocation of the population towards other areas, especially in the plain areas. So you'll find that the people from Himachal Pradesh, Jammu Kashmir and Uttarakhand shifting to the plain areas, if they are rich enough, they will buy, they will buy the property and even the agricultural land to shift to the permanent locations. Then comes the frequent disruption of the transportation. This is very important. As we know that India's borders are under the stress from our beloved China and Pakistan. So they are creating nuisance every month here and now. So we have to put some security forces. We have to create some infrastructural development in the Himalayan states and union territories. For that matter, we require roads. Because of the landslides, the frequent landslides, the roads and infrastructure becomes a matter of concern. Now we come to the landslide atlas that was published by the ISRO itself. According to this atlas, Uttarakhand, Kerala, Jammu Kashmir, Mizoram, Tirupura, Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh are reporting the highest number of landslides between 1998 to 2022. That is the span period of almost 24 years. If you go through this map, you can easily see that the Himalayan region and the other part of the eastern hills and the Himalayan regions along with the hills of the western guards are more prone to the landslides. Mizoram has topped the list with the highest number of landslide incidents. As you can see, this is your Mizoram state where the highest number of landslides, it is one of the darkest region colored in terms of the landslides by ISRO. Uttarakhand's fragility, as you must have seen the recent case of Joshi Mutt, where both natural and anthropogenic reason have led to the landslides. There are a number of districts which have maximum landslide exposures from Arunachal Pradesh, Kerala, Uttarakhand, Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Assam, Maharashtra, Mizoram and Nagaland. As you will observe this map, you will find that there are a number of states where hilly areas are there, but landslides are not there. They include the regions of Aravli, in the state of Rajasthan. Then we have Satpura and Vindhyanchal in Madhya Pradesh. Then we have hilly areas on the eastern ghats. We have small hills in the Gujarat as well, such as Girna. And we have hilly areas and we have certain hilly areas and the plateau part in the east central part of India. So how come these reasons did not show the landslides? Please do comment in the comment box that why these reasons are not showing the landslides according to the ISRO's map. The last observation of the atlas says that Rudraprayag in Uttarakhand has the highest landslide density. So as far as state is concerned, it is Mizoram. As far as a particular region is concerned, it is Rudraprayag where the landslide density is the highest and the exposure to the total population and number of houses is also highest. So it is the most prone area with respect to the landslide disaster. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. Now we come to the articles from the today's the Hindu newspaper. And here the first article that we are going to discuss was published on the business page, which talks about the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Now SVB Bank in US has failed. It has been shut down by the regulators of the banking sector in the US and this has created a concern globally that where the banking sector is now heading towards is the current status of recession, the mild recession, the higher interest rate and the inflationary pressure in US is going to make the entire world suffer. We are going to look towards into what has actually happened in this article. We are going to understand what actually happened to the Silicon Valley Bank and how this has happened because of the move taken by the Fed Reserve. And is this failure of a bank going to impact on Indian economy or not? So let's talk about the context. So Silicon Valley Bank is a financial group 
which shut down recently and taken over by the banking regulators in the US. So this bank is no longer functioning. The reason is that there was a high Fed Reserve rates and the soaring of the risk appetite by the investors. Investors are not investing. Interest rate at the banking sector is also high and both of them have culminated into the failure of this bank. The sequence of the event says that the Fed Reserve or the Central Bank of the United States of America raised the interest rate as we have discussed this multiple times in the DNS previously. So Fed Reserve have raised their basic rates. Why? To control the inflation. The tight monetary policy says that we have to raise the interest rate to make credit expensive for the borrowers. Once the credit is expensive to the borrowers, they will deny taking credit. Once they deny taking the credit, they will reduce down their demand, ultimately helping to ease out the inflation. Now, once the Fed Reserve had raised their interest rate, money become expensive. Because now a person who is taking a loan is going to pay more interest. Once the money is becoming expensive, the investors who were taking money as a form of loan to invest in a particular business are now keeping themselves distant from the new investment. So the investors, let's say, who were working in the Silicon Valley, if you don't understand Silicon Valley, it's a region in California and US where IT sector is dominated, where the firms, the IT sector, Google, Apple, Facebook and many even Indian giants are located. So the investors are not going to invest in these startups. They are not going to invest in the small companies and not even in the large companies. The moment investors do not go for the investment, there is no IPO or initial public offering in the stock market. So nobody is going to go there. Private funding along with this is going to be more costly. So let's say there's a company, there's a startup and they want to run their business, they are looking for the investor. Now, investors are not investing. IPO is already shut down. So where they will go? They will go to the private investor, angel investors. They are giving loan at a very high rate. The moment they say that they are going to make the money or the funding more costly, there is no new fund coming to the startups. Now, the startups are going to fail. What they will do? The only option they have is their saving account or let's say their fund account or let's say their current account with a particular bank. So startups, they are not getting money from the investor. They are not getting money from the IPO. They are not getting money from the angel investor. So they will go to the bank. So they went to the Silicon Valley bank to get money. They started withdrawing money from the bank. The moment large number of people start withdrawing money from a particular bank, a bank fails. Why? Because bank, in order to give them their money, have to sell their bonds, treasury bonds where they invested a lot of money. Now, please understand this. Let's say there's a person A. He has an account in, let's say, SBI. And SBI is paying him, let's say, 7% of interest. Now, from where SBI is getting money? Now, SBI, let's say, has invested the same money of A in Government of India bonds. And here they are getting 8% of the interest. So they are going to pay 7% to the A back. And the 1% that they are getting extra is going to be their earning, their margin, through which they are actually running their business. Now, when all the startups started going to the SVB bank, the bank started selling their bonds and the prices of these bonds fell down drastically and they have to make a loss of 1.8 billion. Even they can't recover, they can't make the complete payment even after selling their furniture. This is the condition. Their stock prices, their market prices of their shares collapsed within days and that is the reason this bank had to shut down now is this a now is this a good sign this is not a good sign not at all a good sign for the fed reserve why because if this continues the large banks are going to collapse once the large banks are going to collapse the entire financial sector is going to collapse and we are going to be on the verge of another recession that we saw in the phase of 2009 to 2011.
This will ultimately lead to more inflation and ultimately going to leave higher unemployment rate in US. And as US is the largest financial and merchandise market, countries which are associated with this nation are going to be impacted. India has a large share of its trade with US. India has invested a lot of money and US has invested a lot of money in India. Indian startups are working in US. They are going to face the brunt. That is going to be the case of concern. Imports are going to be more expensive. Trade is going to be in the negative form. Investors who are already under the stress will not going to be put their financial institutional investors money or FIIs or the financial portfolio investment in India. India is going to face a lot of credit crunch in terms of the capital account under its balance of payment. So this should discontinue. Fed Reserve should take the cognizance of this important event. They should take initiative to bring back the economy on its track and do not allow the other banks to collapse in the similar manner. With this discussion, please let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on the Science and Technology page where a research with respect to Japanese encephalitis vaccination has shown a very promising result. On the other hand, a vaccine already in practice from China has shown some limited results. Now, a research was undertaken, a small trial was undertaken in the Gorakhpur district, which is, you can say, the epic center of Japanese encephalitis in India. And according to this small trial, the live attenuated Japanese encephalitis virus from China has turned out to be less effective if compared to what Indian made virus Genvec is. Now, in this discussion, we are going to look into what Japanese encephalitis is all about, its basic spread across the globe, what Indian government has done in order to restrict the spread of this disease and what is the basic difference between live attenuated virus and inactivated virus. Now, before venturing into the virus itself, let's discuss about the basic difference. Now, there are two types of vaccines which are popularly used. The first is inactivated vaccine and the second is live attenuated vaccine. Inactive itself means that there is something which is inactive and that something is the version of the germ. Let's say the virus. So, we are going to use the virus itself but that virus would be the killed virus and that is going to provide the immunity. This vaccine does not provide immunity to a strong level. Why? Because the virus is already killed. When the virus is already killed, it is not going to generate the higher level of immunity. Body is not going to fight this virus because it is already a killed virus. So, as it is not a strong one, several doses are required, including the booster shots to get the immunity. The best example in this case would be hepatitis A, flu shots, polio, rabies and others. On the other hand, live attenuated simply proves that the virus is live or the germ is live. It is still living, surviving, but it is weakened. It is not as strong as the virus which spread the disease. As it is a live virus, it is providing strong immunity and long lasting immunity. Just one or two dose is enough to provide the lifetime protection from the disease. But there are two limitations. It is very, very limited on those people who have weak immunity. So we cannot allow these weak immunity people to go and get the live virus in themselves. All the people who have long term health problems, who have organ transplant. The second issue is that it has to be kept in cold places only. So those countries, especially the countries where the weather is very hot and warm, requires extra care for the refrigeration that increases the cost of its process. Plus, the developing countries, the poor countries, which do not have the high level of vaccination storage, does not have access to these vaccines easily. Some of the examples of live attenuated vaccines include measles, mumps and rubella or MMR, rotavirus, smallpox, chickenpox and yellow fever. So the vaccine which was used from China was live attenuated virus. Despite that, its efficacy was very, very limited. 
Now, Japanese encephalitis is a viral infection. It is caused by the Japanese encephalitis virus belonging to the flaviviride family of viruses. It is endemic to tropical and subtropical areas of Asia. It is transmitted through the bite of an infected mosquito from the Culex species. Symptoms include fever, headache, stiffness in the nose, disorientation, coma, seizure and even the death of a patient. The treatment of prevention says that as of now there is no specific treatment available. So vaccine is the best we can use right now. So there is a vaccination prevention program even in India since 2006 and there is emphasis given on the mosquito control measures in the locality where this is expressively observed. On the map you can see that the shaded regions in red area are the high in incidence region of this Japanese encephalitis virus including India, China, Japan and most of the Southeast Asian countries. However, there are certain countries, for example, Mongolia, North Korea, for which data is not available. India is among such countries where extensive human vaccination program is being utilized. Now, as far as efforts by India is concerned on this disease, so Japanese encephalitis vaccine is included in the Universal Immunization Program or UIP since 2016 for the children between the age of 9 to 12 months in the high risk districts, for example, Gorakhpur. Government has also implemented the National Vector Borne Disease Control Program to control the spread of mosquitoes. The multi-prolonged strategy was adopted, which included the expansion of vaccination program, public health activities and clinical management, safe water supply, including the areas of slum and the endemic regions, providing high quality nutrition to the vulnerable children, and establishing district disability rehabilitation center where the treatment can be taken up. Now in India, GenVac is gaining currency. This is an inactivated vaccine developed by Bharat Biotech in collaboration with NIV Pune. It is said to be providing superior protection at the end of the two years, even after the single dose. Now the point is that is this GenVac more efficient than what China has been providing since 2006. The question remains to be answered in the future because the sample which was taken to make it ineffective or more effective says that it is a small trial. So more number of people should be brought in, more number of children should be brought in in order to conclude that Chinese vaccine is completely ineffective or very less effective while Indian vaccine is more effective. So it has to be seen with larger trial but as of now the vaccine is available but despite the vaccine availability the cases are not yet being controlled completely in certain districts including Gorakhpur. With this discussion place now we come to the end of today's daily news simplified. Thanks for watching stay tuned for more such updates.